I think we could have filmed what we did already. <laughs> I think we probably and, could have done. And yeah. probably could have done that as an interview. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Well, uh, Tom's here. Uh, he's very much uh, uh, graced me with his presence. <laughs> coming to my uh, back hole of a workshop. Um, it's it's uh, it's quite tidy at the moment, but um, I'm imagining your place is better. No, this is very tidy. It's got much more stuff in it than mine has, but it's much more structured. <laughs> You've got much more mysterious things in here as well. Like, I like a bit of mystery. Uh, mine is all very, very straightforward. It's like, you know, simple speakers, simple, like, a keyboard, and mm -hmm. then a few drawers of components and stuff, and books of components, and lots and lots of books. You haven't got any books in here. Your books must be somewhere else. a couple of books, yeah. yeah. But the trouble is, it's too damp in here. Yeah. That's the trouble. So, yeah. Mine is slightly warmer, I would say. My shed is a little bit warmer. Yeah. I, I did, yeah. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, my flat isn't much warmer, <laughs> actually, at the moment. Oh, dear. Um, yeah. So, I was just going to preface this by saying yeah. that last time I saw you was at um, Machina Bristol. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And you were doing your um, workshops there. Oh, yeah. 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 How did that go? That was good. Yeah. It was, I mean, they it's an amazing event. Yeah. Uh, the kind of. I remember the first one, I was so amazed by just the scale of it. You know, it really is, it seems to be the sort of second biggest thing in the world, possibly after <laughs> I think so, yeah. After Superbooth. Yeah. Uh, it's maybe about the same, they used to have one in America called Machines and Music, it was in New York, mm. I went to once. And that was summer-ish, but yeah, a really nice, friendly, you know, event, and it seemed to work really well. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? But that, I didn't actually tell you at the time, Yeah. that wasn't the first time that I'd met you. Oh. I don't expect you to remember <laughs> because it was it was it must have been seven or so years ago. Now. Yeah. Uh, but um, the way I got into all this stuff was through my friend Elliot. Yeah. Uh, and you came and did a talk for us at his uh, synth club that he used to put on. Was that out in Ealing? In Ealing. Ah, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. I do remember that. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, that was uh, it was fantastic, and that was when I was just just getting started and stuff. I see. Yeah, no, I do remember that. And what does Elliot do now? Um, Elliot's uh, he's in Portugal at the moment. Yeah, and then he's coming back for a couple of months and moving to Hong Kong. He's doing um, like development work for a company. Wow. Well, okay. Yeah. yeah. He's yeah. doing very well for himself. No, I do remember that. I went to the pub. Yes, we did. We did a talk and I went to the pub. pub. Yeah. Yeah, they had a fantastic 9% ale in that pub. <laughs> 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 I can remember we got a bit loose. I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, it was, that was good. good. The, yeah, the the preface for that um, that uh, synth club was basically pub club. I see. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's always the way. <laughs> yeah, and that was in the university. I never didn't go to the university. Ah, uh, okay. That makes but I used sense. to always sneak in, pretend I was a student, and yeah. rent their microphones and things. <laughs> so that was great. Yeah. yeah. But it was really cool of you to come across and do that. No, for I remember us. the tutor asked me to do it, and I now cannot remember his name off the top of my head mm -hmm. but yeah it was a it was a really nice thing it was really good yeah and you were very patient with answering my <laughs> silly questions <laughs> I can't remember what I asked at the moment but, but it was it was something ridiculous um, but <laughs> yeah you encouraged me which was very nice good and a, a lot of my um, early stuff is very much inspired by you I mean you'll see all my panels look very similar to your kind yeah. of panels <laughs> <laughs> you know I unashamedly really copied you and uh even the spacing of these knobs oh, is yes. actually the it's same. Really, yeah. I actually measured it off of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, we were just saying, looking at your beautiful glowing row of relays there. Uh, Thank it's you, just Tom. amazing. I'll snip, I'll snip that out. See, for, but seeing that bit, that bit then being triggered off a Turing machine there is just so cool. And the, when, it was, when it was playing earlier on, the sound of that is just amazing. It's quite fun. Yeah, it's really good off the Turing machine. You can basically use the Turing machine to program it like a like a drum machine. Oh, I've plugged in the wrong one. Where is it? There it is. There you go. It's just brilliant. It's quite fun. <laughs> I mean, it's totally ridiculous. Yeah, but that's what's good about it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I I always attribute a quote to you, but I'm not sure if you actually said it. Maybe you can confirm. Uh, with these kind of utilitarian kind of scientific-y style yeah. panels. I seem to remember you saying, uh, I'm not very good at graphic design, so I don't. Yeah, that's definitely right. I don't remember okay. saying that, but that's right. definitely it. Yeah, it's, it's how little can you put into it? I, mean, yeah. that's, I think that's true with all of it, and I think, you know, when we were talking earlier, I think that idea of how do you do the smallest, simplest possible mm -hmm. thing, quickest. how do you strip it back? Yeah, quickest. How do you... And how do you balance that, the amount of work you're going to have to do against how much fun it's going to be or how 
many other people might find it useful. Yeah, that is a constant kind of balance, I think. Are you normally quite <coughs> concerned with other people using your stuff? I think I want, I definitely want to put things out, I think. I, I want, and I think that some of the things that have been most kind of um, rewarding, I suppose, is when you make something and then other people do something really different with it. Yeah, yeah. So That's that good. kind of when, um, with microphony, which is the contact mic mm. module, when that, that was basically just a joke, you know, that was like, wouldn't it be funny if you could hear all the switches and, yeah, yeah. and things being plugged in and out. And then people started using it for so many different things. People started recording like hydrophones of ice melting yeah, through yeah. it or using it to trigger the kind of clapper strong, you know, using it almost like a kind of instrument you could pluck or play with a plectrum. Mm -hmm. That was just amazing to, really to awesome. have that simple, to see that idea develop a life of its own. So I think... Well, that's definitely something I always try to you try to think how can you leave something open enough so that other people can build in the space for other people yeah, to interpret it rather than trying to just you know pickle a patch or kind of just right. trying to just you know this makes one sound really well yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's trying to leave it open enough so that people can do more with it it was really interesting for me to see uh, the move module that you made, yeah. which has got like a clicky relay in, and, yeah. but with the with the um, movement sensor, yeah, because it's it's kind of related to to this one, but yeah. but coming at it from a completely different place. Yeah. So it's 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 kind of like the the um, uh, the comparison between the microphony and uh, Emily's version. Yeah, it is it's, it's like a similar type of thing, but yeah. uh, that you've you've come at it from a different angle. Yeah, yeah really interesting to see someone else's perspective on it and that was very much again that was that was what that you know is again a kind of joke almost mm. but what i found actually interesting was was just having a relay in a module with a with a trigger is really quite interesting and there's lots of, i i was using it for panning <laughs> i just really enjoyed oh, really? super hard oh, yeah, yeah. clicky panning it was really interesting uh when i'd made it yeah, i was yeah. like there's things that and actually, the, the the PIR movement thing obviously really isn't terribly useful, but it's quite it's quite interesting. The sort of I did enjoy that idea of you just have to stand back, exactly, and it does something. And then yeah, if you yeah, yeah. go near it, it stops. I can <laughs> find quite a different way of engaging with the thing. Absolutely, I, I've definitely seen. I'm going to make a big declaration. Here, <laughs> I've 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 see a kind of theme going through a lot of your work and experiments and investigations and things of the of exactly that of the removing yourself yeah from it yeah even to do with you know the uh, generative kind of yeah stuff that you were doing. i think when we were coming here i was thinking for you it feels like your thing you're aiming for and this is a big statement from my side Essentially, it's a uh, Enigma machine, but that makes interesting music. Yes, yes, you and it's really quite a lot less mind. less Nazi-ish, right, but yes. more interesting techno. <laughs> you know, yeah, do you know that was a big, a massive consideration when I was yeah. making that. I know, I bet. how to make it not Nazi. Yeah, because that obviously. is obviously a problematic it device. It is. Yeah, but but that sense of a kind of beautiful interesting to use mechanical device that makes interesting music feels like where you're aiming mm. and when i was then thinking i was like well what is it that i'm aiming for and i don't <laughs> know any time so i think the idea of something you can you can leave and yeah. walk away and it does something interesting or that you make very yeah i think that that's something that is i mean generative is a very fancy kind of word sure, but that sure. that brian eno thing of i'll set it off and then somebody comes yeah. to the door and just leave a recording and come back and it's made my album for me I, I see it's something more than that with your stuff though because like it's almost uh especially with musical stuff is you, your aim with music generally is to try and make uh, an emotion or something and it's a very human thing and you'd think that you'd have to have a human putting that into the music yeah um, but if you remove the human and just yeah. have the machine generating it, what are you then you observe what are you missing? Yeah, or yeah. And I and I think the other thing I've always found interesting is with that is the role of things like repetition in that as well. Sure. So that idea that you can make any random nonsense. Yeah. Perhaps any random nonsense that is in a key. 
And then if you repeat it enough, it becomes a piece of music that you find interesting. Yeah. There's it's definitely it's a curious. chunk of yeah, there's a chunk of truth in that, I think. And that and that yeah, yeah. and I think realising that made me sort of think slightly differently about you know, what what then is the thing you're celebrating in music? What's the kind of good good bits of it? What's mm. the less good bits of it? The machines really lay it bare, don't they? Yeah. The yeah. the individual elements and yeah. how they combine. And you're now getting with things like the you know, with Spotify writing their own chill piano music. Yeah. Because really why would you pay somebody to do it? It's fine. <laughs> yeah, you know, really chords, reverb, repetition. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty much, it's not something to pay an expert <laughs> to I've, do. I've been seeing a lot of your XY plotter art. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a kind of similar type of thing, generating art with a... Yeah, that idea edition. of, yeah, that, which again is, is often sequences and repetition. I thought what was really interesting right. with that is that that kind of classic sort of 70s version of that, which is essentially making uh, Bridget Riley stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, it's all repetition and cubes and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. But then there's this other other guy called uh, Harold oh, Cohen, Cohen, yeah, who's completely the opposite of that. And the stuff he does is incredibly kind of organic. Yeah. And I I honestly can't understand how he did it in in 1960s kind yeah, of yeah. punch card computers and Fortran or whatever because it 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 just is I yeah I can't work out how to do it now and it's a really interesting how different it is from all of the other that kind of plotter art that was being done at the time what 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 shortcomings do you find it in trying to replicate that? it's just very it, the way his his so he will he basically draws shapes that look very organic hmm. And then he will do things like um, he will kind of process each shape. So he might then draw a bunch of lines coming off it uh, that makes it look like it's got shadow on it. Mm -hmm. Or he might draw another shape sort of on top of it. So it starts to look vaguely kind of three-dimensional. And to do that, you obviously then, to start with, you need a map of the entire environment Mm so that you can have no collisions so you can have and i find, i mean i'm not oh, yeah. a especially good programmer but nobody else seemed to be doing it at the time if you if you say okay well am i am i going to draw this on a and actually from reading more about it i think he just ran the whole thing on a kind of i don't know like 200 by 400 grid or something okay and just somehow says well if there's something in this don't draw into it but when you look at his pictures the lines are perfectly kind of aligned. They kind of yeah. match up perfectly in in the way that a human would do it. Like it's not at all different for, for a human to do those things. And his kind of randomness as well is very. It looks to me very human. Mm. Yeah, in that yeah. you, I mean, I'm genuinely looking at. It, is he just lying? Did he just <laughs> draw this? Because, but I mean, he actually. He, the, the way I came across him was when I was uh, eleven, mm. uh, growing up in Bristol. He had an exhibition at the Arnolfini in Bristol, the modern art gallery. And I remember he had these big plotters in there drawing this stuff out. And I remember finding it very unimpressive because okay, as an yeah. 11-year-old, I wanted the kind of squares and science fiction and, and Bridget Riley and that kind of thing mm-hmm. was what I would have would have enjoyed. That's what looked computer. I remember there was an exhibition of like fractal computer art at a similar time and that seemed amazing and very high tech this was just like weird drawings and I didn't really like it uh, and then you know 30 40 years later what sparked the, the there was an exhibition in London of his work okay. and I saw it was on and I was like well it's kind of interesting as it's there mm. and then was just really struck by how on earth did he do yeah. this and then you got into trying to do it yourself. And then I, well, I had a plotter before then and was right. doing lots of, you know, you know, grids and sure. stuff. But then, I mean, I haven't spent a long time trying to recreate stuff. Mm-hmm. It was just that there was the way with all of that other 60s plotter art, it's pretty self-explanatory. You look at it and you go, okay, it's a bunch of squares yeah, moving yeah. over or it's lines going into a centre or whatever. It's all, you know, and some of it's really nice, but it's, it's, you can almost immediately see what the code to do it was. Mm-hmm. Whereas with this, you just, you know, I've done bits of it trying to draw shapes and 
you need this whole kind of uh, collision system and you need to do all this yeah. stuff which which he he was an artist so he grew up in the he was a successful artist in the 60s he was in um he was britain's uh he was at the venice biennale as a painter for britain mm -hmm. and then you know the impression he maybe had a bit of a kind of midlife crisis and moved to california was it uh, one of the, oh, I can't remember which, which university it was, but in the kind of AI department of that university in the early seventies, and they kind of taught him how to program. And yeah, it's just a, a kind of really, and he he was gradually developing this system over time. So it was a real sort of expert system. So he'd keep adding things to it. Yeah, yeah. So as you see, his work just gets more and more complicated. It's really interesting. To see it starts the with these very simple kind of. It's things like he will draw like, I think he calls them stones, and it just looks a bit like a stone. Sure. It's that, you know, and it's basically a polygon with some, but all the sides of it are a bit wobbly. Yeah. All the lines are a bit wobbly. wobbly. I'm just like I, just drawing a convincingly wobbly line is quite yeah. difficult. Really difficult. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's not yeah. like an oscillating line. Yeah. It yeah, yeah. Looks, like, and he would have like three or four of them together, and they look just like when you draw lines mm. yourself. And some of it might be the noise of the... He used um, those turtle plotters initially. Okay. But even then, you you can't then have noise from that and then have lines perfectly joining it. Yeah, too. that's true. So it's very so mysterious. It's controlling the uh, imperfections. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly it. It felt like a very... And a very, you know, interesting how organic it is through a, what must be quite simple... I think it's just not simple. <laughs> There's the other thing. It might just be <laughs> thousands and thousands and thousands of lines of code yeah. that he was doing. I don't know. Amazing that you can see the progression, though, for all his different eras of work. Yeah, it just gets more and more complicated. It. And at some point, yeah. he starts doing people, and then he does... Right. And he gets notions... That because he's a painter, he has these notions of things like foreground and back. He's very mm. concerned about, like, closed shapes and open shapes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get a real sense of sort of sky... And ground in them, they're kind of landscapes. But yeah, it, I just found it really interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I did it's ask the people controlling his estate, could I just have a look at some of the code, please? Yeah. And I said, no, no oh, you really? can't. They're keeping it no. a secret. They're, they're, oh, I think there are a lot of people doing research on it, probably. Okay. Also, I don't yeah. actually know how to use. I think it was Fortran initially, then it was oh, right. okay, yeah. something else like probably, yeah. Lisp so or these, something. These it's that sort of cards. thing at the start. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All that fun stuff, yeah. But that's a. Uh, all the modular stuff uh, I find really allows you to break down the individual elements of, of music or, or what I, I'm trying to do one thing where I'm <laughs> I'm trying to uh, make a quantizer for a language. <laughs> oh wow. So you feed in noise yeah. and then it will it will do it on here something hopefully closer to words. And you're just inventing an LLM now. Um <sighs> Yeah, because that's <laughs> basically how they work. In a really silly way. <laughs> An analog LLM is quite an interesting idea. Yeah, but it makes you then think about like, well, there's a certain repetition of uh, the a proportion of vowels to, to yeah. whatever, and there's a, you know, and you start breaking down all the structures of language to try and shape noise into something that would be within the statistical probability of normal language. So that so really I mean. reminds me. I was talking to. Uh, Guy who's written a book, I try to remember his surname. It's called Peter B. Something. Mm -hmm. He's written a fantastic book about um, kind of electronics and spirits, and he does a whole okay. chapter on spirit radio, yeah, yeah. which is exactly that notion, essentially of. And there's experiments where if you play somebody white noise, they've done experiments where they play somebody white noise, mm. they say, right, what we're going to do is we're going to play. It's a hearing test. We're going to play a recording of a football game and just write down as much as you can hear from it. And you'll hear it's quite quiet and there's a bit of background noise in there. Mm. Play them white noise and they write down the football game scores. Oh, wow. <laughs> because people are so tuned to listening and they're really trying to Filter figure it out, out from it. Yeah, yeah. And they, they report back what they've seen. That's amazing. And, that, and the, the, a lot of those kind of ghost radios... Is exactly that idea of you kind of sequence cut up radio sounds, mm -hmm. and then you're listening and you're trying to understand the, the the ghost. You hear the voices, 
and you believe those voices are the spirits speaking to you. Well. Yeah, yeah. And that, I think, is where the repetition comes. You imagine if you're doing that in a repetitive way, mm -hmm. you're going to get more and more convinced that the message you're hearing is actually you know, great Aunt Ida telling you <laughs> sure. she's fine in the new place. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Um, uh, what was I going to say? I had a really good point and I forgot it. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. I shouldn't do interviews, should I? <laughs> yes, I wanted to talk about your graphic scores. Yes. Because um, that's all about interpretation. Yeah. And, you know, you see something that could be white noise visually and then you see your great Aunt Ida talking to you yeah. and you play that through your clarinet or whatever. Yeah, and I think that, that again, is a sort of... Because I'm doing this thing in, in next year where somebody said, can you come and do a retreat in Cornwall mm -hmm. where people will come and we're going to stay in a nice house in Cornwall and we're going to make graphic scores and we're going to play them. Uh, and for me, it's it's quite different. And the thing I find really interesting is that it lets you uh, kind of turn off your internal judgment okay. and your internal censorship. So instead of saying, I am going to try and make some music that is right or is good or is nice, mm -hmm. you say, I'm going to make some music that is in line with the specification of the score. And yeah. the specification is essentially meaningless because it, it's lines or it's shapes or whatever. Right. Or it might be an emotional prompt, but you're, you're just trying to do that. Mm -hmm. And so at the end, you can say, well, I, I tried my best to do that, so I've succeeded. Whereas I think often when you're trying to do music, you're trying to make something that is in your head, you're trying to make something that sounds like something else or sounds good to you yeah. and at the end you often look at it and go oh, I'm a bit disappointed that's not really what I had in mind I guess so you're that, concentrating on the end point yeah rather than the actual inception of it rather than the process and rather than what you're doing now and yeah. I think it's a bit like improvisation as well that notion of you're listening and trying to fit in mm. to that rather than trying to be impressive or be kind of clever and so there's something interesting about that that idea definitely but I think I think if you were to ask John Cage for his view on graphic scores, it would probably be quite different from that. <laughs> but you, you say that they're kind of meaningless, but you went to the British Library and studied uh, a load of them. Yeah, so that, well, that was... There must be, there must be something... Well, I suppose, that, I suppose the specific thing with that is... So the, the most famous kind of British graphic score is Cornelius Cardew's... Mm. Um, I know uh, it from the... It's on the uh, radio music. The yes, standard, yeah, exactly. Uh, bits thing, yeah. of it there, yeah. Uh, and um, that is a, a very kind of beautiful, interesting looking piece of, mm. of art, basically, of, of lots yeah, of yeah, yeah. curving lines and shapes. And, and, and so what I was looking at the British Library was the, his kind of final proof of that before it goes to the printers is in all his papers in the British Library. And I guess he was drawing it up on on paper and then this is the last stage we traces it all onto tracing paper and so you see all this hand drawn hand written everything and it's amazing and i suppose yeah if you look at something that is interesting to you maybe you're going to get more from it you're going to try to do you i don't know really absorb something from it yeah or, even yeah. if it's subconscious yeah and and i suppose if i suppose the other thing is if you're going to want to spend sometimes studying something interesting yeah then you want it to be something you like but then when i did that when i did that thing a few years ago i did that thing of making an album in an evening with a mm. with a, the scores for that were just literally kind of print out from a computer they weren't they right. weren't graphic they weren't interesting they were just prompts and again it was just having the prompt meant you could sort of defer judgment yeah, that was the real yeah, thing yeah. it's just deferring, deferring judgment, judgment. And saying I'm not, not trying to. Yeah. I'm not overthinking. I'm not trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to get through three minutes of this one. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then I've got another three minutes afterwards to try. <laughs> and I just want to do something that I feel like somehow I'm reading this. I'm trying to make sense of it. I'm trying mm -hmm. to do something that represents that. Do you, really do you struggle with the like overthinking things or? or? I, I mean, I struggle with doing music itself. Generally. Okay. I, I think I don't, I don't ever feel like 
if I'm actually trying to make music, that it's very satisfactory or very kind of... I wouldn't feel like I was very, you know, happy with the outcome of it. Mm. So I suppose that's why I'm interested in those kind of automated... Yeah, I, feel like, I mean, the main thing I think is feel like I'd be much better at making circuits or writing sure. articles than I would be about trying to make music. <laughs> so, well, yeah, but what, why do you keep doing music then? Well, I don't have much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. I spend a lot more time in a room like this doing this sort of thing than yeah, I would yeah. trying to actually, you know, record anything. Would you say you enjoy making the things more than using them? <laughs> I enjoy the overall process of making them and then seeing other people use them. Right. I think that's definitely that's, it. I yeah, think that proce really the process of having an idea and then seeing it all the way through to yeah. then seeing somebody else using it, that I think is the, is fundamentally the, the satisfying thing. Mm. Do you try and wring as much as you can out of the, the process of it? Are you quite no, it just takes a really long time. <laughs> no, I'm not saying it takes a long time. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, it's... I no, find it I, does, though. But what were you saying? Yeah. Well, if you, if you enjoy the process of it, do you... And with going to the British Library and stuff, and it, you obviously you want to dive deep into... And, uh, it's not just a, a quick thing that you bash out. I think it depends. Yeah. It, it depends, that, really. Like I think if, if, yeah, if it's something you enjoy, mm. then I, d I think also it's partly about something I think you, you're very good at as well is that there's always a story behind what you're making. Right. I mean, not very much that you design or that I design is like, well, it's an oscillator. Sure. It's got a particularly pure sine wave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It might be there's an oscillator and it's got a particularly pure sine wave because of this interesting method that was devised by this person and this mm -hmm. is why they did it. And this is very similar to the one used in the, the space probe. Sure. But it wouldn't be, <laughs> this will be the cleanest. I did actually do sound. that. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> I, did, I did, yeah. I made a, a quin, Quindar uh, thing. Do you know when, on, when they talk to the astronauts? Right. They, they, it goes beep, yeah. boop. And it's it's a signal to change the antennas from receiving to sending, and I, I made that in a module beep boop. Perfect. It, but it was perfectly tuned to the frequencies they used and the and the length of time. But that's what I mean. Is it's a, <laughs> it's a pure. I think that's why I enjoy your stuff so much because it's oh, it's you. always a story, and yeah, it's, it's it's kind of. I think the stuff I will do. I'm I need to have some kind of a story around it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just... Well, I mean, the other thing, I think, is there is so much stuff. There's a lot of I mean, stuff, I think, yeah. I think that... Do you pay that, attention to much of it? Like, if you keep up with what's coming out? And I can't keep up with, with everything that's coming out. Yeah. yeah. Um, certainly not. This is, if you watch any of my videos, you'll, you'll constantly hear sirens and things. <laughs> yeah, it's just... Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, no, I, th I... Yeah, I don't... I can't keep up with everything that's coming out but that sense of you have to have something different yeah. and, it, and there are lots of different ways it can be different it can be bigger or smaller or mm. cheaper or more expensive or better or faster so or, there's a value in itself of being different well I think I think yeah it's being different I think you're always trying to be different in some ways because there's lots mm. of different ways to be different yeah. and I think I think what we would both do is that there is a uh, the narrative is a big chunk of it yeah. it's like if you don't understand the narrative it's just it's just it's just occurring to me now that so much of our lives is trying to fit in with other people <laughs> and then we spend hours and hours and hours trying to be different <laughs> yeah. create something different yeah. I, don't, I haven't really figured out in my brain yet but yeah it's I, I learned a new word from you uh that i realized i do in all of my designs and i can't remember the word and you'll be able to tell me it's when you take an existing uh old technology and then uh kind of Oh, like skeuomorphism. That's yes. it. Yes, that's definitely. It. Yeah. And I, I was yeah. when you said I heard you say that, and I was like, "That's what I do." Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was. Uh, I still haven't figured out whether it's a bit naff or not. I don't think. I mean, I think it's because it come. Well, when it became really well known was with interfaces, with the icons on desktops. Yeah, things. or just yeah. like you particularly get it in music oh, software, don't you? Mean. Yeah. You got music software, yeah. it's quite dusty and it's got yeah, all yeah, that yeah. stuff, and all the controls are knobs and this kind of thing. They make it look like a mixer, yeah. Yeah, exactly that. 
And so to some extent, we're immune from skeuomorphism because it's real physical mm. objects. But, yeah, I think it would be fair to say that a glowing panel that looks like the Apollo guidance computer is, to some extent, skeuomorphic. skeuomorphic. <laughs> quite on the nose isn't it <laughs> they, NASA's going to sue me I think but I mean if, <laughs> but a row of beautiful glowing relays <laughs> can't be skeuomorphic because it's actually a row of beautiful glowing relays I suppose yeah I suppose and had yeah. you had you had like it's like when you get um, things with valves in them mm. and then they put little orange LEDs behind them yeah that is proper hardware skeuomorphism and I'm sure you would never do such a thing I, I, I'm pretty. T- I, these are definitely. I, t- these used to be LEDs in here, and I put bulbs in. Yeah, you, they, they uh, glow beautifully. Yeah, and that's important. Yeah, but and somehow that's right. Whereas if you had, maybe if you had an RGB LED and you could pulse through whatever colours you wanted. Yeah. Including a nice warm glow, maybe mm. that would be uh, inappropriate. I think it would be very inappropriate. Little trimmers <laughs> on the back to set the colour you want. <laughs> well, the reason why. I, got rid of the leds is because i didn't want people putting ugly colored leds in it well that's very good that's completely <laughs> so i was correct. like well i'm gonna make it the the, the wires on the bulb are too thin are yeah. really thin so i make the pads too small to put an led in yeah so you can't put an led in <laughs> i mean when when people started making rainbow turings like, that was fine <laughs> yeah oh, it must be really interesting to see all the different ways it that is that's when you stuff. put things yeah. out into the world and they and they yeah, um, yeah. generally i mean they don't do anything are you quite quite relaxed with? Yeah, the there's not been anything yeah. that I've ever looked at. There's been things I looked at and said, "Well, I probably wouldn't have done it quite like that." Sure. But yeah. Mostly just people putting blue LEDs on them. Apart from yeah, that, yeah. it's fine. With really ugly knobs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I think if, if someone buys one of my modules, they have, they're totally at liberty to put whatever knob they want on it. Exactly. That's fine. Fine by me. But no LEDs into those. It can't have LEDs. No. no. I've, I've cheated a bit with LEDs here, haven't I? They should really be bulbs. Yeah. Yeah, if I was doing it properly. <laughs> yeah, Do you, uh, it's just talking about control yeah. and stuff. Um, is that um, in your in your designing stuff? Um, how how do you, how's your, what is your relationship with um, uh, control? <laughs> because I, I this is another theme in in all of your work. Yeah, and you've got a module called control. Yeah. So um, that well, that control module, I can I can literally remember the moment when it sort of came into my head. Yeah, because I'd been doing these really tiny things. For some reason, I had this idea of doing something that was like the size of a USB stick, mm-hmm. and like as a controller, and I'd spent ages kind of fiddling with this thing with little displays on it and like um, accelerometers on it and. And it was kind of interesting, but I was like, I'm not sure this is actually at all useful for anything. Because mm. it just puts out merely over USB, and what's it really for? So I've been thinking about, about that a lot. And then suddenly I was like, that's totally wrong. I was just literally riding my bike along through through West Norwood or somewhere. I thought, no, that's totally wrong. It should be the opposite to that. Uh-huh. It should, and I think it was also going to, it was just after the... Um, Brighton modular meat mm. and I was looking at somebody who had um, I think it was one of those big Hordike modulars with like big chunky knobs mm-hmm. like, yeah. that's that is the way <laughs> that's what I should do <laughs> need something big with some big knobs so that yeah, even yeah. if you've got something with small knobs on it you can plug this in and then you can control it in that pleasing way and so it just like I was like that's the thing I want to make absolutely and then managed to add several really pointless features to it. I mean, it take ages to design; it's a complete waste of time. And I, I never plug anything into them. But that's okay. Uh, I have that on my modules. <laughs> that's alright. So somebody might use them in an interesting way. Well, though. that's it. You I never know. I so. was saying to somebody the other day about I was saying exactly this. And I was like, for example, I've never used the CV input on a Turing machine, and he was like, yeah. No, that's critical. I use that all well, the time. Okay, then. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's really interesting because you've managed then to to actually design something for somebody else that wasn't that's for outside me. of the brief for you. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Which I'm quite uh, uncompromising in just doing it exactly the way that I want it. But then it's also you don't know what other people are gonna. No, and so I, I don't think you can do that particularly deliberately. I was just like, it's modular. It should probably have some CV into it. Yeah, that's true. I just didn't yeah. really 
I never particularly, I, mean, I suppose I have used it for things, but you, you, you need a bit of kind of scaffolding around it to really use it, so you need to run so, sort of an envelope into it, yeah, so it has yeah. time to randomise a bit. And then it's you often need to then have a negative envelope going into it, so it just right. becomes a bit of a kind of faff. So I often don't. I end think up it's a really patching. interesting idea, though. Yeah. You know, because then you can then you can program it so that it. And you can leave it, and then exactly. something else. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That is really good. Um, and uh, what was I going to say? Are, are you are you are you comfortable calling yourself? What do you call yourself? Uh... I'm a, uh, a managing consultant. Okay, but in in the music and watching. In the music thing, I think so. I went to an event the other day and yeah. was there with Matthew from ALM and Matthew from ALM was a proper, real professional synthesizer yeah. designer. And I was standing next to him. We were introduced to as the modular people. Okay, <laughs> but that's fine. I am. I am yeah, the modular person. people. Yeah. yeah. So I think I would say I was a, a, a design electronics or okay. design instruments I if, guess. I, if I were to call you an artist what would be your, your reaction to that I mean it'd be nice but I'm not terribly convinced by that <laughs> I don't think it's I don't there must be a definition of that mm. and I don't think that would be I don't think I would I think I would struggle to fall into that is that a, at all an aspiration or I mean I like that idea but I think mm. I'm I'm sort of I think I'm reasonably good at working out the things that I'm good at and trying to focus on them rather than other things. Yeah, yeah. Are you, are you having enough time to focus on the things you want to do at the moment? So I am now because I have a sabbatical. Fantastic. So yeah. I've, I've given up the day job for a year and I'm not entirely doing this, but it means I've... I, uh, it's very nice being able to have the time to then really focus into things and say, yeah. I actually want to really understand this. I'm not going to say, oh, that's a normal circuit. There's a, you know, there's a um, a standard circuit I could just use for that, or there's a standard way of doing that. You could say, okay, I want to really understand what yeah, is it yeah. doing. Dig it around, find something good. Um, so I've been doing a couple of things I'm doing at the moment, trying really hard to have as simple parts as possible. So trying to avoid anything that's weird, anything that's like exotic. Yeah. Anything that I use, you want it to be something where there's four different versions of it you could use and just chuck mm -hmm. in any of them. Because I think of that sort of low level trauma of the kind of chip shortage. Yeah, exactly. Of I remember going to see it. going to see Finley in Bristol and him saying, I can't get transistors. <laughs> and that idea that you yeah, couldn't yeah. get the most obvious basic building block. Yeah, yeah. Um, though that doesn't really help me because I'm definitely putting just transistors and things. But that idea of I think trying to trying to do something that's a bit more basic rather than the sort of well, I'm going to have a big microcontroller and a big expensive DAC mm. and some knobs. So is that that must be really influencing what the kind of things that you are making and the limits of it. It is to some extent, but it's yeah, yeah. I suppose it's very. I mean, you must have this. You have an idea that you're trying to do, yeah, because you've got a part that can do it. And it's sure. Very mutual. Yeah. Sometimes the idea comes from the part. Yeah, absolutely. You've got a lot of part lying around, and you think, yeah. what can I do with this? Exactly. Yeah. So I think I think it's not it's not being like super kind of pedantic about it. Sure. It's just as a general, like as an example, and I, and I may well abandon this idea because it might prove to be too annoying, but I was doing something that does have a microcontroller in it. Mm -hmm. But rather than buying a DAC, a digital audio converter output chip, which would cost like, I don't know, five or six pounds or something maybe for mm. a decent one, say, well, can I actually design a circuit that's a bunch of op amps and that does a similar thing Mm -hmm. But is then or a bunch of some logic chips is then uh, that's not going to go out of stock. It's not going to change. You're not going to need to rework the circuit because that particular DAC isn't available anymore. Yeah. You've got a bunch of things that work. I have done that. I've designed something, but it, I'm slightly concerned that it's now three chips rather than one, and it may just be a bit too much space. But it's, <laughs> but it's, it's always the compromise, though, isn't it? There's yeah. always a compromise. It's always something. Like, yeah. yeah. I was showing you the the slide scanner thing that I've got, which is a uh, that uses the chip that's obsolete, yeah. 
and uh, yeah, I, f I feel your pain. <laughs> but I mean, I, I think also if you've got, it's one thing if you've got one of them. Yeah. But if you've got a stock of 300 of them or something, sure. or a number of them, it's like... You know, that's fine. It's, you think of it as a limited edition thing and it's got a life and you keep enough so you can replace them if they go wonky, but... Yeah. It's yeah. not like... Um, it's not like designing something that is going to be mass-produced but then you're going to have to redesign it. But I was talking to talking to a designer in, in Berlin who'd had a terrible time in the chip shortage of designing something seeing the chips weren't available, redesigning it, then those chips disappearing, then redesigning yeah. it again, and those chips disappearing. Yeah. And by the time you finish all that, you go back and you can use one here originally, but you've wasted two years of it. And I mean, I've had it with, with radio music that you just can't, can't buy the teensy anymore to go into it. So that's sort of on the list to then at some point redesign that. Yeah. How, do you, how, do you, how motivated do you feel to do that? Uh, no, I am motivated to do it. I've just got a few other things in the queue. Yeah. That's um, the one, I think yeah. you could make something... With that, you could either make something that was better, mm. Uh, mm. or you could make something that was the same, but cheaper and, and easier to produce things. and that sort of thing. So I'm probably more likely to go for the simpler, but cheaper one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but to see, I mean, other thing, it, it may be that I'd like to have that thing available again, because I think it was an interesting module. Mm. And it's annoying that you just can't really get them anymore. Have you had... Um uh, occurrences where you've revisited older projects and then analysed your own work. Yeah, I've, I mean, with the Turing machine, um, well, I was thinking that, that is the first ever Turing machine That's amazing. PCB. So that was the second PCB I designed. So the first one, first one was just this really simple kind of adapter with plugs for a breadboard. Um, and this, I mean, you can see there's quite a lot of sort of little bodges and, mm. and things that are wrong on there. But the main thing with this was I didn't know how to route. So when you're making a PCB, there's a thing called an auto router. And if you don't know how to route PCBs, you press the button. Why and wouldn't it, you? And it does it for yeah. you. Uh, and it does a reasonably good job of it. It kind of can connect things together. But... Uh, sort of um, visually now because I know how to do it I look at this and I can see these ridiculous traces on it that just seem <laughs> yeah. absolutely wrong and mad and uh, it doesn't have a ground plane on either side I don't think Okay. Yeah. and it's just it, it feels really kind of weird <laughs> to me um, being able to see it like that but um, so I, that was the very first one then I went and revised that a few years later and did it a bit more nicely yeah um and i've done similar things with other things like with the spring reverb with same i did did a kind of version of that and then went back and did an improved version of it so as a, as as you learn you can go back and that's the thing yeah have another go i definitely know with a couple of my projects i've i've been aware that i'm not quite good enough to complete it or yeah. i haven't quite got the skills yet so i've kind of put it to the side and worked on other things and then come back to it. And with the with the slide scanner one, that's actually been basically inside that are about five other mo separate modules. Yeah. So I'm making those five separate modules yeah. to learn how to make the big one. Yeah. yeah. If you know what I mean. Um yeah. And, that's and how do you how do you learn how to do things? It's a that is a very good question, Tom. You should be interviewing me. <laughs> um, <laughs> How do I learn to do things? Aren't the most of the sources of my kind of learning is the internet, yeah. You know, um, and that's YouTube, really. Okay. Um, which is so it's not really books. No. It's it's watching people and then mistakes. Yeah. Um, so the initial start is YouTube. That gets you started, or yeah. or you Google something and it's it's on a forum. Two people have argued about it a lot yeah, on yeah. a forum, and you're like, okay, that's an idea, and you just put it on a breadboard, and it doesn't work. Yeah. And then you just spend about a week thinking, why doesn't this work? Yeah. And then you eventually figure it out um, through. Uh, it's a it's a very good. I'm finding it hard to answer the Do question. Do you use uh, simulators? No. So I've got completely addicted to 
file stack, which is the really simple browser right. based. Right. Uh, I I find myself using that like multiple times every day. I just if like if I like if I'm just trying to remember how to you know work out like a resistor divider or something, yeah, yeah. I will call that up. And the thing I'm the thing I'm designing at the moment, which is basically an envelope, a kind of slopes kind of thing. Mm. And I've put it into Falstad and it kind of works. Okay. But it looks like the program is really kind of struggling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I don't trust this. I don't, I, it, it, I'm not, I think maybe the design does work and this is just kind of a bit flaky. Mm -hmm. Or maybe the design totally doesn't work and you're just pretending it works. So I'm having to go back to doing proper breadboarding okay. just to, to try and oh, actually work out if this really yeah. work. But I use that all the time for just like trying to figure out ideas, trying to you know, also just things like optimizing levels and stuff. So if you've okay, got something yeah. in there and yeah, you yeah. want it to produce, you know, five volts rather than ten volts or whatever, just, just I I because I don't think mathematically at all. So I like okay, if yeah. I'm if I'm trying to to work out you know the levels through a system or something, mm -hmm. I will always basically do it yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of experimentally and I see just, if I get to work I do exactly it. that but in the real world yeah. really wastefully and I just I showed you my pile, yeah, yeah. Of, pile of used resistors um, yeah. yeah that's basically it trial or error yeah trial no, error. I quite like yeah. being able to do it on the sofa just or on the train yeah. or something and I, I know I know that that makes sense and I know that using microcontrollers and things makes sense but I still do it well microcontrollers is a different thing because the, the simulation is just exactly the same as breadboard but just mm. practicing but yeah, I think yeah. it's funny I now I'm so used to it I then go into Eagle into the PCB I try to use the same keyboard shortcuts it's really annoying <laughs> <laughs> so the, yeah. the, the simulator is really simple like you press R and you get a resistor and yeah, you press yeah. W and you get a wire and you just go that's good and it's really nice but then I'm sure you can remap it oh no that would even be nightmare <laughs> can't be bothered but it's quite but yeah that, that process of of thinking experimentally I think is a it definitely, but the other thing I was going to say, well, the other thing I've tried as well is since I've got ChatGPT, mm. right. I use that to teach me things all the time. That's really interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, haven't... particularly for coding, it's absolutely extraordinary, and I, I'm I'm definitely much more. Like you were talking about having the confidence to try things. Sure. There's definitely now things that I will have the confidence to embark on because I've got ChatGPT as yeah, a, kind yeah, of yeah. A, a mentor and an instructor. That's... The worst thing when you and obviously it's wrong sometimes, but yeah. then your mental's wrong sometimes. If I was trying to teach somebody, I'd be wrong most of the time. I hadn't thought about it that way at all. That it's it's a uh, you know a little friend to help yeah. you. It's exactly yeah. that. I'll be like, what what are our approaches to do this? Mm. And and then so I was doing a thing with coding the other day. So I met somebody, and he was talking about we were talking about sampling. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about uh, wanting to kind of retain his music that he recorded, and he was like, "I'm going to put it onto 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 tape because I don't trust computers. I don't okay. think you'll be able to listen to WAV files in 50 years' time." And I was like, "Well, I think you probably will, but why don't you just print them out?" Yeah. And he was like, well, "What do you mean?" I was like, "Well, WAV files just a load of zeros and ones. You just print it out, and then if you lose it, I mean, you've got to type them back in, but..." You know, yeah, yeah. So he he said this, and then we had lunch, and I went home. I was like, That's an "Interesting idea, the idea of printing out a web yeah. file." And so I sat out with with ChatGPT, and I was like, "Right, first thing, can you take a web file, take off the headers, and give it to me as a string of sixteen bit binary numbers?" Yeah, yeah. And it makes you a little Python program, and you run it, and it does it, and you've got a text file with you know, 44,000 binary numbers. Like, okay, okay, let's start. And I said, are there any good ways of making PDFs from Python, like for a book? Uh -huh. I ask it this. It yeah. says, yes, there's a thing called, I don't know what it's called, Report Lab. Uh -huh. It says, you can use Report Lab or you can use Latex. I was like, Latex sounds really complicated. I don't want to get into that. I'll try this Report Lab thing. I say, okay, can you now take that thing you made of the binary and run it down a page of a PDF? Comes back. Works great. Okay. Can you make the text a bit smaller? 
Okay, and then I can look at the code and I can go, right, okay, let's make it 8 yeah, point yeah. rather than 10 point, whatever. It does that. And then I'm like, right, can you do three columns? And it does it, it's a bit wonky, you have to go back and change it, and then there's three columns. I said, right, now, and I want then six columns, but I want you to put a little dot that represents the size of the number next to it, so it's like a waveform. Yeah, yeah. It does that. It's amazing. And it was incredible, and you, <coughs> you take it through it, so it's not like you say to it, right, make it this, and you yeah, have to status. describe it, you have to be quite you know, deliberate about yeah, how you yeah. explain things to it. But, and there are a few bits where it just got really stuck. But uh, the, the, after a bit of that, I then had a system where it made chapters in a book, made a 300 page long book, right. and then I said, right, I'll give you, I'll make a CSV file with sample number and chapter heading. Mm. And then, when you're making the book, when you get to one of these numbers, break off, make a new page, and put a little chapter at the top, and then carry on. And I was like, okay, this is kick drum starts, or snare drum starts, whatever. It did all this. It's I mean, it was so incredible. It took, okay. took me, like, basically a long evening. I started about it's nine o'clock and went to bed quite late. Yeah. But it, it made this ridiculous thing that I'd... And that was a good example of not necessarily investing too much time. I wouldn't have wanted to spend... You know, no, a week the, or two on that. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I'm not sure it'll ever come to anything, but it was just a really interesting idea of being able to. Yeah, because it, there are so many projects that where I don't want to invest that amount of time into, but it'd be yeah. really cool to have it. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, you're converting. I, mean, I, 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 I've always felt this uh, kind of. Uh, oh, I don't like AI because I've, I've kind of this. I have a. You need to suffer for making things. Which I know is very this unhealthy. This just helps you be more ambitious. That's all it is. Yeah, you don't exactly. need to suffer. You just need to be as. I, I think definitely I am. I am more averse to suffering than you are, though. <laughs> I, I, I'm less well, likely. We're in my freezing cold I, I'm garage. I'm less I'm sorry, to, I've made you sit to embark on. Like we've got. A, I've definitely thought this thing. Wouldn't it be cool to be able to feed punch tape into your module? <laughs> but then I've thought, yeah, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> It's and then you come along idea. and go, oh, that's great, I'll do that. <laughs> well, it, it's not completely, it's, it looks like this at the moment. So. But I loved how you were saying, no, the electronics is really simple. Yeah, I know the electronics is simple. <laughs> I could work that out. It's yeah. the little motors and the no, holding it and the, the reels and the, all that stuff. <laughs> I think, yeah, I don't know if I'm uh, uh, overly optimistic or, or just... Well, maybe this is, maybe, maybe if you went on ChatGPT, they'd be like... Ah, what you need is a seven seven three six transponder, yeah. and this company in China has got twenty thousand in yeah. stock, and they're twenty pence each. Yeah, I mean it's worth a try. <laughs> At this point, this project's dragging on. I need to get it done. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm gonna. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't know why I feel that way towards making things that you you, that you have to suffer. You have to suffer for it. Yeah. No, really I, I definitely it. don't feel like I have to suffer. I feel like I have to take all the help I can get. Right. So if I can think of a of a shortcut, then I will definitely take it. And if I can think of a, and I think that's where things like things like PCB panels, mm -hmm. which you used to not you used to have. To, I mean, I, I always think it's interesting. You look back at synth DIY of the seventies, mm. when as we were talking earlier, you etched your own circuit boards. Yeah, yeah. Which then meant you had to drill your own circuit boards. You had to design them one by one I guess with tape or with like a or you'd photo print onto them and yeah. that sort of thing. Then you had to get your front panel made out of metal mm -hmm. engraved somewhere that would cost you about sixty quid. Yeah. And you had to send it off in some weird program to Germany and then come back and you'd have these beautiful front panels. Yeah. And then you would do some enormous elaborate wiring. You then have your circuit board there and then masses of wires going up to all the knobs and the switches like this. But is that and it was just just a nightmare. <laughs> I'm like, I, nightmare. I, wouldn't want, I wouldn't want to do any of that. I do think that within that way of doing things, you, you definitely get individualism. And you, you, yes. everything is made by a person. Yeah. And you can tell that it's made by a specific person. Is there yeah. a danger of losing that with, well, with, with it's, deferring it's a, to AI? It's a different... I don't think it's to do with the AI, I think it's to do with the manufacturing side. I mean, okay. it's definitely the things I design are not individual, they're mass-produced. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's, 
for me, that's the magic is being able to say, we have the tools to be able to make things that, that even with the most esoteric things you're doing, the tools that you've got, to be able to mass produce things with cute relays in them, yeah, <laughs> would, you know, that would have been an enormous pain in the ass for somebody to do twenty years ago yeah, yeah. or forty years ago, <clears throat> and the fact that you can do that so it's accessible and cheap and it's easy to easy to produce, I I think is quite a different thing. I think, and I think maybe you can put in the the creativity and go somewhere else. Mm-hmm. The fact there's so much more of this stuff than there ever used to be. 